one of the things that we talk about, the importance of getting a link to not your homepage of your website, but a really compelling piece of content on your blog or in your resource center or your knowledge center or wherever it happens to be from the articles that you're getting placed. And most communicators will fight me on that. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 journalists will not do that. They'll never link. And you're like, that's not true. <laughs> it's, it's not true. Welcome to the Smart Talk series, the show for professionals who want strategies, tips, and real talk about all things PR, marketing, and social media. Your host is Melissa Vela Williamson, an award-winning, accredited, and nationally recognized PR pro and communication thought leader. And now your host, Melissa Vela Williamson. Hello, and welcome to the Smart Talk series. I'm Melissa Vela Williamson. This season, our focus is on communication trailblazers. Today, I'm joined by Jenny Dietrich. Jenny Dietrich is the founder and CEO of Spin Sucks, host of the Spin Sucks podcast, and author of Spin Sucks, the book. She is a creator of the PESO model and has crafted a certification for the PESO model in partnership with Syracuse University. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so honored that you're joining me. I have been a fan for quite a number of years, and you have such an impressive body of work, even online content. But tell us a little bit about your background and what you're up to today. Oh, what am I up to today? Jeez. Um, <laughs> it's funny, you know, I started in the big global PR firm world and moved my way up the ranks. And I love to tell the story that we were, we did, I mean, we did some phenomenal work in my 20s. Like, we were working hard. We were working 100 hours a week. We were traveling the country. We were staying in fancy hotels and eating fancy meals and drinking <laughs> fancy wine. And I mean, it was just like looking back on it, we certainly were working our butts off, but I made lifelong friends because of that work that we did together. And we were working with great clients. I mean, Bayer was a client. BASF was a client. Kellogg's was a client. Welch's was a client. And Ocean Spray was sort of the pinnacle of what we were working on. And they were launching their 100% juices at the time. And our job was to do sampling, which <laughs> as a PR team, we wouldn't necessarily do today. You know, there, there are events teams and, and guerrilla teams that would do that work now, but that didn't exist yet. And so the PR team did it and we traveled the country and we went to festivals and we gave out samples and we just worked our butts off and we created this traveling art fair that that we donated all this money to America's Second Harvest. Like it was just such a great campaign. The whole world talked about it. We built a cranberry bog in Times Square. We were on Good Morning America and the Today Show. Like it was just, it was phenomenal. And I'll never forget sitting in the conference room, you know, doing our dog and pony show. We all have our suits on and our heels on and we're, or the men had their ties on and we were doing our dog and pony. And I'll never forget the CMO sat back in her chair and she put her arms, hands behind her head and she said, you know, this is great. And I'm sure you're very proud from a PR perspective, but sales are down, we're losing growers. And she just started to go through the list of everything that was wrong. And it was at that point that I went, I mean, it still makes my stomach upset, but it was at that point that I thought there has to be a way for us to do this kind of phenomenal work and measure it to results and measure it to the business outcomes. So that was the genesis of me starting my own business. I didn't do it immediately. You know, I went to another agency where they let me test and take some risk and spend some money to figure it out. And then I started my own, but with the idea that we would be able to demonstrate that we're not just a nice to have, that we're not just fluffy, that we actually are building something that's going to help the company grow. Yeah. And, and so tell us about your agency today. What are your focus areas or do you have specialties? Is it measurement? Me personally went from food. Um, I did a little bit of Celebrity Chef and I did some work with the Food Network and, you know, went through that whole thing. We did some high end restaurants, which, you know, they don't pay their bills. So we got out of that <laughs> and the agency has evolved. And now we only do B2B SaaS and we focus on companies that have been have their first round of seeding through about Series C. You know, we haven't taken a company public yet, but we've gotten them to that point where we help them build process internally. And it's all around the peso model. So we are hired now to go into an organization and help them structure their communications team around the peso model. 
and really figure out how to work with marketing to be able to do that. Because in some cases, marketing will handle like the search engine marketing and the growth marketing and the conversion optimization and things like that. But they have to work with the communications team to be able to do that work and vice versa. So that's where we focus all of our time right now. Yeah, no, that's it's phenomenal. And I think that I really do want to talk about the PESA model because I think if pros haven't experienced it yet, it's such a wonderful tool and approach to thinking about integrated marketing communication. So tell us about the PESA model, <laughs> break it down for us, and then like the origin story, because I'm really interested in how you came up with such a simple way to look at everything. <laughs> yeah, I love it when people ask me this question is like, <laughs> it's it's so embarrassing because it was not I, I mean I should not even admit this out loud but it was not some like strategic epiphany that we were like oh my gosh let's build this model and the whole industry is going to take a hold of it and we're going to do this and it's going to be great that did not happen at all the real story is that we were already using it inside my agency but it didn't have a name, right? And yeah. certainly when you're building process and you're, you're branding and things like that, that's one of the first things you should do is, is name it. But we didn't. We didn't have a name for it. Um, but we were using and we were using it, you know, and in some cases we were testing it out because it was still the early days. And I was writing Spin Sucks the Book. At, you know, I got up at five o'clock every morning to write. And it, as part of that process, I was I wrote down in the book what it was and why you would use paid media and earned media and shared media and and owned media. You know, I tr was like, is it social media? Is it shared media? Like, you know, I don't want it to just be limited to social. So let's find another name for it. So we went through all of that. I sent in the, the first draft of the book and my publisher said, I love this. What's its name? And I was like, uh... I don't know what what should we name it and and so we went I, I'll never forget this I was sitting outside of Starbucks but it was probably it was winter time it was cold but I was sitting outside the sun was shining and I was sitting on one of the benches out there and I was on the phone with her and we were going back and forth and we were like okay should it be OSP so it's owned earned shared and paid should it be OSEP owned shared earned and paid and we were both like this just doesn't make sense and all of a sudden she said well what about peso and I was like are we gonna get in trouble for calling it peso since there's a whole currency and <laughs> thankfully they're huge publishers so they went down that road and they're like no you can call it that no problem at all um so we did and then she came back and she said, okay, now we need an image to describe, to like depict it. And I was like, oh man. And at that point, I'll be per perfectly honest. I just wanted to get the book done. I was just like, and, and I'm sure you know this exactly right now in this, where you are right now. You're just like, I just need to finish. Oh yeah. So I went to Upwork. I hired a designer. I was like, this, this is what it is. He was great. He created this Venn diagram and then he listed the tactics underneath each. And it was perfect. It was great. Like printed it in the book, got copyrighted it, the whole kit and caboodle. Of course, we looked at it a couple of years ago and we're like, this doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, Google Plus was on there and Vine was on there. So we rejiggered it so that the image itself, the graphic itself is a little more strategic and it's not just a list of tactics. But the idea is that it's really easy for someone to grasp it pretty immediately. So you throw that that graphic up on the screen and the person you're presenting to or the team that you're presenting to goes, Oh, I get it. So it's it's a really easy way to depict what we do. No, I, I really, really love it. And we'll make sure that we link to it in the show notes and on the website page for the podcast, because I think everyone should have access to it. You know, we've been able to look at it as a checklist. And I think much like you, so much of the work I've done, because I'm almost I'm a couple of years shy of 20 years, I didn't have a name for it. And sometimes it, it's right. so hard <clears throat> to explain it to other people. And kind of share that knowledge without having that framework or name. And what I thought was super brilliant about the PESO model was, you know, the S for shared. Because it, it helps highlight the fact that you do not own the content you put on social right. media platforms. <laughs> right. And so many organizations right. invest so much time in keeping Facebook up to date and Instagram up to date. Yes. And their website yes. is wildly out of date. Right. And, yes. and uh, they're yes. not producing yes. anything that they own. And, and I'm like. Y'all, it's like when you lease an apartment, the stuff in there may be yours, right? <laughs> but any day or maybe a That's, condo, yeah. they can take it from you and you just hope to be able to get your stuff out. 
And, uh, you know, right? I'm not sure that's going <laughs> to... That's a great analogy. Yeah. That's a great analogy. I'm not sure that's going to happen. Like if Facebook and eh, Mark Zuckerberg just decides, you know what? I'm done with everything. <laughs> I'm done with this. Uh, we're not going to be able to download all the content we put on there. And, right. uh, right. you know, the panic that happened a while back when Facebook was down for, was it a day? I mean, my gosh, a day. people yeah. lost it. Yeah. And and the number they lost their yeah, the number of sales that different um, shop owners said they lost because that's how they sell on Instagram. They sell on Facebook. And so it has to be multi-channel, multi-purpose approach. And so I love what the Peso model does to really illustrate that with those, you know, Venn diagram circles, but then also provide almost like a checklist for people to just when they're doing their planning, they can remember all the different ways they should be communicating to their yeah. audiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really important. And so kudos to you all, because I know the hardest part of communication, I think, for most people is to make something simple and easy to grasp and understand quickly. And, and that's what the Peso model does for our industry. And it does it for leaders, too, because I think one of the biggest challenges we have, like I say this all the time, that I'm convinced there's some secret school that business leaders go to that we don't know about. <laughs> and and the, at that secret school, they teach them that if they just get in the New York Times, all of their problems will be solved. And so then they're like, OK, I need to hire a PR firm and they need I need I need to get in the New York Times and I need to have a corporate profile. And as soon as that happens, everything's going to be wonderful and we're not going to have to spend a bunch of money on sales and we're not going to have to spend a bunch of money on search engine marketing. It's just going to work. And. That that's just not the case at all, as you know. Right. But it, it's so easy for them to understand because you throw that graphic up on the screen, like I said, and they go, oh, oh, oh. And you can see the light bulbs mm. going off because then they begin to realize it's not just about getting in the New York Times. There's so much more to it. Yeah, absolutely. It all has to be working together. And, and what I often find myself talking about is that because PR is so based on people and relationships, you can't force those. So there's parts that you can control and you should control what you can, right? And create on your own, but they complement what you're ultimately trying to do is if you have that PR point of view is you're looking to make the relationships with people long lasting and grow over time. And so in some ways, like I have a client that they're, you know, we're almost about a year in, they're really starting to see the fruits of the labor, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, wow, I'm like, yeah, it just compounds over time if you're doing the right things right, across these areas. But I do find that some clients don't quite have the patience for that entire system to be built and then the, you know, the gears to turn and for it to start moving. That is correct. Yeah. Yes, that is exactly right. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, can't you just pick up the phone and get some results in the first 15 days? <laughs> That's not exactly how that works. <laughs> well, and I love it too when I'm like, well, first you have to clean up your house because uh, your operations right. are a mess. So, <laughs> and that's what I love about being the PR person is like, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm your advisor, right? And I'm not right. a yes right. person and we're going to tell you the hard things. So yay for peso and the hard things. I love it. That reminds me, I always say that we're more therapists than we are anything else. Like <laughs> Certainly counselors. We <laughs> right? Well, and I will have a breakdown. So I'm going to have a chapter on integrated marketing communications in the book, which is really a primer for pros who want to get in the industry or transitioning journalists, Love it. right? Yep. And yep. so Peso Model will be in there. Perfect. And um, I, I really want to understand from your point of view, you know, you have a certification for the Peso Model. What do you think pros can really get out of going through that program? There are a couple of things. I will be very frank and say that it's challenging. It's not an easy certification to get because it requires that you think a little bit differently. And for professionals who have been in the business, you know, I would say probably 10 years or longer, it's really challenging for them because we require you to think about doing the things that you do just a little bit differently, tweaking it slightly so that you can get results and so that you can demonstrate value. And that in some cases is really hard for people. And I'll give you a great example. One of the things that we talk about, the importance of getting a link to not your homepage of your website, but a really compelling piece of content on your blog or in your resource center or your knowledge center or wherever it happens to be from the articles that you're getting placed. And most communicators will fight me on that. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 journalists will not do that. They'll never link. And you're like, that's not true. <laughs> it's it's not true. But that is the first instinct that most communicators have is there's no way 
that a journalist will do that. There is no way I'm going to ask. There is no way I'm going to to risk harming my relationship by asking for it. And it's just just not true. Like most journalists, the only time I've ever been told no was by TechCrunch. And that and I tried and tried and tried and tried. And finally they <laughs> linked to the homepage and I was like, okay, I mean, I guess that's better than nothing. So they they did eventually get there, but they're the only ones that have I've had to sort of put my foot down with. And I mean, it, it ended up being better than nothing, but it was it was a struggle. But that was the only time, the only time, and I've been doing this for ten years. Like the, every time we ask for a link, they they insert it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I totally understand the search engine optimization piece of it for us. I yeah. totally understand that this is a great piece of additional content. Like we're not sending them to a sales piece, we're not sending them to a landing page, we're sending them to really compelling content that supports the article, and so." all to say that it's it's really challenging for a lot of communicators. So it's not an easy certification to get, but once you get through that, you understand the value of all the other pieces. You understand the value of search engine optimization and of, of domain authority and of Google Analytics and of you know the, the data that you can get out of your CRM and bringing them all together. Yeah, it can be complex, but in some ways, pretty simple, like you said, because the backlinking, right, that helps both parties. And so if you can pitch it that way, like, hey, because now I'm thinking I'm going to put in my email pitches like, and please link to this resource, right? It helps you and us with SEO or whatever. And they're like, oh, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, but it's true. That's great. No, it's it's on my bucket list for sure, because I, I would love to. You know, just the the more I've learned some of this work, you just have to immerse yourself in it and it just becomes yeah. part of your DNA and you're able to do it. But I always have to go back and say, oh, what was the fact, right? Or let me re- remind myself on the terminology because I just kind of know it in my bones at this part. Right. But that doesn't mean it's easier for people who don't to hear me and, and understand what I'm talking about. So I, I love it. So, okay, we'll look into that. That's on my certification list. Um, Well, you know, I want to ask you one more thing about integrated marketing communication or communication planning, and then we'll talk about spin sucks because that is super interesting. (laughs) But with all this um, work that you've done around teaching about integration, what part of integrated marketing communication or communication planning, what kind of execution do you see pros get wrong? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, hmm. I would say there are two things. One is not the refusal, but maybe the defensiveness that comes with working with marketing. And I think that's just human nature. But I see that a lot where people sort of put their arms around what they own in their fiefdom and they're not willing to collaborate or be part of a team to be able to succeed. So I see that a lot. And I also see that professionals, and I would say this is not just communicators, I would say it's marketing professionals in general, tend to focus on one thing and one thing only. And you know, we just had this conversation in the Spin Sucks community, but somebody was saying that, you know, how do I invest in my own professional development when I'm running a business, I have employees, I I have small children at home, like, like all the stuff, you know, how do you invest mm-hmm. in your professional development? And I think that's the other challenge is that most of us get into our lives and it's busy and it's a lot and we don't, we forget to focus on ourselves. And so I don't know if it's, you know, we were talking before we started recording, but if it's blocking time, that can sometimes get derailed by school. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if it's, you know, when I was writing Spin Sucks, I really did. I got up at 4.50 every morning, turned on my computer. I was writing by 5 a.m. and I only wrote for an hour. And that was it. Like whatever I got on paper or didn't get on paper in that hour was what I did for the day. And that was it. And that's how I got the book written. So that doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but finding ways like that to be able to, to focus on your professional development so you don't get stuck. I absolutely agree. I think finding a way is is the way. And that's what I think has been so frustrating in these last few years going through this pandemic and all this uncertainty is that the fundamentals of what makes our profession good, those don't really change over time, 
right? We evolve the methodology, right? but the fundamentals are timeless. And finding a way and being a creative problem solver has always been a part of that work. So it sounds like really a lack of openness to collaborating across the aisles, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and then um, having just kind of that one discipline focus, I, I think that really is a very dangerous way to build your career. Totally while, while we can specialize, you're just not agile enough right. when you're just only do one thing right. um, or only do it one way. So yes. Right. Right. Let's right. continue learning and growing and doing. And I think the idea and embracing of integration is that. And what it means to me, Jenny, and I, and I don't know uh, what your thoughts are on this, but I think it's okay to have a specialty. And then like, so I would tell people, and I kind of talk about um, your model and how I think about it. I always think about, before I, I learned about your model, having this 360 degree approach. Because mm-hmm. on top of, I tended to be the sole communicator in a lot of traditional jobs I had before I started my own firm, Ugh. which meant I did everything external and everything internal. And then I really got into, at a corporation, diversity and inclusion work. And so I've really done all sides of the house. And at least been responsible for directing all of that, right? Right. And what that all meant to me, I think at this point, the way I understand it best is, okay, I have a PR expertise or point of view on all the communication types. I'm going to think people first, right? But I have to be able to understand at least which lever to pull, depending on what the need is, right? Right. So I just want to underline that. That doesn't mean you have to kind of be that jack of all trades and not really good at any one part of Correct. PR disciplines or communication disciplines. You can't have an expertise in one side, but you at least need to know enough Yes. how they should be in your toolkit. <laughs> so. Yes, it, you're exactly right. One of the best analogies I heard about artificial intelligence are the robots taking over our jobs. And I'll never forget, I, it must have been a webinar or maybe one of his uh, weekly videos, but Chris Penn was talking about it. And he said, here's how you think about it. Like you ha- And this is how you think about your specialty versus being able to pull the levers. You will have artificial intelligence or humans doing certain jobs. And that's what they'll be doing. But you are conducting the orchestra of them. So you're conducting the team, you're leading the team, you have to be able to to say, okay, we need some paid media here, we need to we need to throw some dollars against this to be able to amplify and distribute it. Or, you know what, we really need some third party credibility. And while I might may not be the best person to go pitch it, I can find the best person to do it. And you know what, maybe we need to just do some social media for this just to get the word out. Whatever it happens to be, you're right. You have to just have enough knowledge to be able to pull the lever. I mean, I'm not a, a search engine marketing expert. If I were to focus on one thing, it would be content marketing. That's what I do and that's what I do really well. Um, but I know enough to be able to say we have to do it and we and here's why and be able to sell it to the leadership team. Perfect. That must be why I'm so comfortable in this space because I was a drum major in high school. <laughs> so I'm <mute. laughs> I'm like, yes. no, I don't know how to, <laughs> That's exactly I why. don't know how to play your horn. I just know how you need to do it. Okay. I, I know you need to do it though, right now. <laughs> Get in line. Let's go. <laughs> I love it. I'm using that from now on. It. That's better than the there orchestra. That's great. <laughs> I'll have to send you a picture of me and my whistle. And <laughs> you should. Yeah. I'll, and I, every time I say it, I'll be like, so my friend Melissa is <laughs> a drum major. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, so there are really, I think for some pros, it can get a little overwhelming with all the choice there are in communication tools. Sure. Um, Yeah. In terms of the PESO model, do you find that there's a suggested order or priority we should think about these types Mm. of media in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Well, the the real answer is it depends, right? I mean, if you're an e-commerce business and you have to sell widgets as many as you can, as fast as you can, then paid media is the right place to start. For most of us, though, most of us, it's usually owned. And it goes back to what you were saying. If you're creating all your content on social media, it can go away. So we always look at owned as the foundation. So you create your content and you house it on something that you own. And then you rent it out to shared you know, and distribute it and get new fans and followers and brand ambassadors and believers. 
And you use earned media to give it that credibility, or sometimes I like to say the good housekeeping seal of approval, like, right, they're like, yes, this content is great. Mm -hmm. We were talking to this organization, and here's why, boom. And then you use paid to amplify it. And sometimes it just needs that extra little boost. I mean, LinkedIn, I don't know if you're doing a LinkedIn newsletter, but this is the most fascinating experiment ever. So I was tinkering around right before the holidays. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to republish some of our more popular content as a newsletter on LinkedIn. I went from like just starting to 80,000 subscribers like six weeks later. Oh, my gosh. 80,000. Like the ability to amplify it in places like that is incredible. I can't, I don't have 80,000 subscribers on Spin Sucks and I've been doing it for 12 years, right? So the ability to be able to do it in that way, but again, I'm not creating new content there. I'm, I'm repurposing and I'm driving people back to Spin Sucks from some sort of call to action from every piece of LinkedIn content that I do. Oh, thank you. I'm going to do that right now because I know that your LinkedIn you have to like comes to my email and I'm yep. like, how does she have time to <laughs> develop all this? Or who she, because I nope. know when, <laughs> when you, yeah, I mean, because when you develop content, I, I think as a writer, you want it to have your voice. So there's only so much you can delegate to a team or form right. out, right? Right. So I, I, I love that. It's brilliant. And I love that you are kind of tinkering to see, okay, what is this? I will say though, that there's this ancillary weird thing that happens where your clients aren't necessarily subscribed to your blog or your content, but they are following you on LinkedIn. And so they'll make comments. They're like, oh, yeah, so I read that article. And you're like, you you, you did? Oh, did I say anything? <laughs> oh, you you read that article. Oh. And like you go through this whole process. Of <laughs> right. Yeah. Did I mention you? What happened? Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> the, I, like I'll talk about, you know, we have a client and I tried to like mix clients up so that nobody knows. But yeah, I mean, I talk about clients all the time on there. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. In the book, I'm trying to give good stories, you know, because they're sticky. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm not naming names. And there's <laughs> an absolute reason for it. Right. Because I'm a PR. Right. So. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, tell us about Spin Sucks because, you know, is it that call to action? Is it a mantra? What is Spin Sucks? And how did the community get started? Oh, it's so funny. So many years ago, we were sitting in our conference room back when we had an office and we were talking about this blogging thing and we were like, what is this? Should we try it? Do we offer it to clients? Is it another tool in our toolbox? Like, what is it? And so as a team, we decided that we should at least try and, and figure it out. <clears throat> and we were like, okay, great. So we've made that decision. What do we call it? And we were like, maybe it's the fight against destructive spin. Maybe it's, and one of the interns said, I think you should call it spin sucks because that's what you say all the time. Because it drives me crazy when you tell somebody you're in communications or PR and they're like, oh, you lie for a living. You're one of those. And you're like, no, I'm not. I don't. <laughs> the, the, no, we don't. Li yes, there are parts of the industry in certain segments that might. But most of us are pretty ethical. We follow a, a code of ethics. Like We don't buy. We don't spin. And so we looked and the domain was available. And so Spin Sucks was born. Um, and it's been fun. Like, you know, the idea was just to see if the, this blogging thing worked and had any merit. Turns out it did. <laughs> um, and it has evolved from there. You know, we looked at in 2011, we looked at creating a professional development site and it, we were too early. And so I kind of licked my wounds and co-authored a book, um, marketing in mm -hmm. the round, which afforded me my second book, Spin Sucks. Um, that I got to write by myself. And it's just evolved from there. Like we've been very strategic about it. The, the Pacel model, not so much. But in this case, we've been very strategic in saying, okay, we need to do this next. And this is what's coming next. And we, you know, we think about it about three years out to be able to provide the best professional development and the best community for the industry. That's great. And, and I love it. I, I like your candor a lot because it, it's true. Sometimes these brilliant ideas are just very organic. They kind of just... <laughs> Pop, and, and everything syncs up at one moment and you're like, oh, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, you know, it, it finally came together, right? Yeah. Versus it not being strategic. And then I think with something like you're talking about with Spin Sucks and planning that out, I think, you know, our work is so much a mix of both. 
right? A little bit of magic, a little bit of methodology. So <laughs> it is, you know, it's so funny you say that because one of the, I think one of the other struggles that the communicators have with the PACEL model certification is it's a combination of both art and science. And so people who are going through the process will say to me, but what about, and I'm like, see, this is where the art comes in. Like trust your instinct, trust that you know what you're doing, trust that you have media relationships and do that. Like it doesn't have to always be science-based. And that's when they go, oh, so it is, it's it's art and science. It's mm. magic and strategy at the same time. Yeah, I love it. Well, this has been so enlightening and I think a, a lot of fun too. Um, and I find you to be a brilliant person. And uh, <laughs> I love to hear you on your podcast, the Spin Sucks podcast, as well as um, your podcast with Chip Griffin. Oh boy, and Chip and I. <laughs> he's fun. And he's right. You're right. It always depends. And yep. uh, I love that. So, you know, on, on my podcast, I like to ask different kind of pros, like this idea, this concept, because that, that's something that I'm really intrigued by. But what does the concept of smart talk mean to you? You know, smart talk to me is really about exactly what you said, talking to people who have different ways of thinking about things. And you said something earlier that really resonated, and it's that you don't have to have just one way of doing things. There can be multiple ways of doing things. And if you allow yourself to, I think it was Adam Grant, it was either him or Benjamin Hardy, who said, you know, unlearn your behaviors because just because it's the way that you did it yesterday doesn't mean that it, that's the way you're going to do it tomorrow or the way that you should do it tomorrow. So unlearn those behaviors. And I think what you're doing with smart talk and helping people understand that there are more than one way to do things and that's okay. Actually, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, because I think that the benefit I receive in having these real talk, deeper conversations is all around the learning. Sure. And I absolutely believe that we have to unlearn some things. And I talk on diversity, equity, and inclusion a lot. And really my stance is always like, you know, give grace because no one's perfect. And a lot of times we have to just override our system. So right, right. be ready to override and unlearn <laughs> and have the good conversations that help you do that, right? So Yeah, that's exactly perfect. right. Well, Jenny, you're a wonderful pro, uh, certainly a pioneer in the industry. How can our listeners or others connect with you or learn more? It's so easy. It's on spinsucks.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jenny, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, thank you. It's so nice to talk to you. And thank you to our listeners for joining us for today's episode. We love unpacking communication topics to elevate our industry practice. Keep an eye out for the release of Smart Talk, the book, this fall, by following the podcast and our MVW communication social media channels. And if you enter your email at mvw360.com slash book, you'll get updates on the release of my book, opportunities for giveaways, and more. You'll be the first to know every milestone we make. And as always, think smart and communicate smart. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Smart Talk series. If you learned something or enjoyed our conversation, share it on social media or send to a friend. To learn more about this and other communication topics, visit mvw360.com. That's mvw360.com.